Hello, everybody, and welcome to the inside of my slide. No, I'm just joking. Uh, welcome to the last, literal last deck and last lecture with myself, John McQueen, and my ability to talk to you about this class before you head to your uh, cumulative final exam. So, you know, let's get to it, right? So let us talk about what is moving forward. We just talked about social change, which is an extremely powerful topic. Let's talk about moving forward and what that means to you. So <clears throat> let's get going. So social change causes, we talked about this before, you know, there's many different ways, tipping points, thresholds, uh, catalytic dynamic impacts, causes and effects, uh, ways that we move in, ways that we don't move in, how people interact and how they don't interact, who wants to interact and who doesn't want to interact. These are all things that impact our day-to-day -day basis in regards to social change, right? So it's kind of cool. So social change causes, well, people, population, consumption, collective behavior, and social movements. Essentially, you're looking at how these things happen. This is the holy recipe towards getting this done, having an understanding of it, and knowing about the circumstances of which we will see, we won't see, or maybe won't be able to see, or be able to find, understand, codify, break down, social change, tons of stuff, right? So what does it mean? So the social movements are based upon a collective understanding of collective and behavior and agency, environmental issues and climate change. We're facing them right now, which we might see a much, much, much higher resolve in people actually responding to it as the temperatures get high. You're looking at 40 Celsius in the UK, wildfires, floods. It's starting to show its impact. And that means we can no longer just ignore it bleak, bleakfully and act like it doesn't exist, which let's be fair, is how a lot of the baby boom generation, Gen X, and a lot of generations have looked at it, that it's some other generation's problem, which that solution is starting to phase out and die out. So technology and innovation is how we start to see the changes happen. How do we go net green? How do we be able to have zero consumption? How do we make changes so that we can have a longer time on this rock? Uh, innovations towards space travel. Do we have to find a new planet? Do we have to get an idea? long conversations, right? How do we be able to repurpose, reuse? Uh, how do we recycle properly? These are all things that can cause us social changes as well as on the other areas of the social behavioral dynamics. Uh, in sociology, we use environmentalism to understand behaviors, patterns, and issues. And we uncover lots of things. If you've seen Aaron Brockovich, that lawyer's case, who's also married to that or was married to that real housewife of <laughs> Hollywood. Uh, yeah. Um, that's a whole thing. Um, but essentially globalization impacts this. There's so many different areas of social change, right? It's, it's a big deal. So population demands production, resources, cost, energy impact our environment. Uh, duh, if you didn't know that, just joking. So Statistica and as well as the US Central Bureau of Investing Internal Database are the data is what you can see right here. What we're looking at is that world hunger rises for the third successive year. We're looking at from 2005 to 2018, and it was on an increase in 2018. There was a huge dip between 2005 and 2010, not like huge, huge, but like yeah, you can see a change from 947.2 million in 2015, it was down to 785.4 million. And in 2018 plus, we're seeing 821.6 million. So we're seeing hunger become problematic at a high level. Statistica quotes this from the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization. World population in between 1950 all the way in forecasting to 2050. Uh, so hunger is increasing. Yeah, sure. And uh, population is not. So that's the worrisome part right there, right? We're looking at uh, in 1960, 3 billion. Now we're in 9 billion in 2040 projection. And sitting where we're at about now, we're seeing about seven, seven and a half billion. So our numbers are increasing. What are we going to do? This is going to be part of your plate. Y'all are going to be steadfast in the middle of this. So consumption ideas, our lifestyles come at a price. Are you willing to deal with that price? And look at this image. Uh, Maybe I actually found out in one of my classes that some of you were not familiar with this idea. Sorry, I had to adjust my chair. Um, this is one of the worst spots in the ocean. It's literally not fixable at this point. It's called, tr it's called Trash Island. That goes all the way down to the ocean floor. And many times, as you can see with this photo of the whale, we're seeing that this is what the fish and the wildlife and the ocean and the ocean life are eating and taking. This is our gift to them as the carers of this world as we have deemed ourselves. So what are we going to do? These images are powerful to see. That's all I want you to see. And uh, people, social movements, collective behavior, we can make a change, but the question constantly, is it too late? My answer to you is no, it's not too late, but we need to start making some big changes. So modernization is a good conversation as we go towards modernity, as we get more innovative and Lenski talks about, we start controlling the environment that surrounds us. We need to have an understanding of what that means. The modernization is technological innovation, but we don't have to do that at the expense of everyone around us. Social change, any direction, modernization, progress towards more efficiency. 
So if you aren't familiar or don't remember, Weber famously said, we used to have a traditional versus a rational society, which pulls to modernity, right? Traditional, we did it just because we've always done it that way. And then rationalization is because we're finding a better way to do it. And then modernity or modernization is tying to, is there a better way to progress more efficiently, not just more rationally? Uh, it's a very much based upon technical innovations. Again, tying back to Lenski that we talked about way earlier, that society's innovative and technological advancement is based on our ability to quell and control nature. But that doesn't mean we have to destroy nature same time so look at this we had the pollution right we really need to figure out a better solution so let's look at this modernization theoretically travel doesn't have to destroy does it well i mean it doesn't really you know other transportation at 47 percent. we have nine percent as miscellaneous residential we have six percent with utilities we have smelters and primary metals we have cement and concrete all these you're looking at the idea of 20 percent road vehicles so travel has a lot of interesting dynamicism about how we're impacting the world around us with no emissions um depending upon if i still have the slide in here or not which i'm not sure if i do no so i don't um let's talk about electric cars real quick so the construction of this idea if you aren't aware of what's going on in california right now is they're going to have increased rolling blackouts and the reason being is that their goal to go net neutral by 2030 has also come at kind of a double-edged sword uh, it's kind of the idea of the irrationality of rationality so the idea of the modernity of going towards having a net neutral which is the goal also caused them to shut down a lot of the coal plants and the nuclear plants and then the amount of electric cars that have been purchased has also led to a circumstance where uh, the charging of these vehicles is requiring a massive strain on the power grid so they're actually going to be able to have to use fossil fuels to be able to create enough power right now to help quell that issue. Now that might solve it in the short run, but we're also going kind of hypocritical there because they're going to have to institute new policies and new plays as towards how to gain the energy to be able to maintain the electric vehicles. Another side of this is how do we get rid of the batteries? A lot of times these are buried just like in other places and they have a lot of radiation that can cause a lot of negative impact. So we aren't sure of the long-term effects yet because it's still too, it's still newer technology. So rationality versus irrationality. Are we making the right choices and is this the right path? Well, only time will tell, but it's a fascinating conversation. Is travel going to be destructive or can it be in benefit, right? We aren't taking trips on horses anymore. We're not trying to travel shorter and longer distances by boat. We're using these faster and more innovative ways that we have learned to travel with efficiency, but we're coming at a cost of our social and our economic and environmental impact, right? So interesting thoughts there. I'd love to hear your considerations, but here's a great example if you aren't familiar. Hey, look, I'm going to be in the store. Um, of this situation. The one that I'm in right now is a fully repurposed 3D printed and reused space of 60,000 bottles into an actual interior of a store repurposing and having this ability for high fashion and other institutions to not have to use principal and old school building platforms and be able to repurpose, reuse, redistribute and, and control, right? So 3D food, resources, solutions. We have this thing, 3D printed food in retirement homes. I'm not sure they're delicious, but hey, you know, some of those retirement homes are not really worried about food taste at this point, but these are solutions we have. Are they effective? Sure. Are they ideal? Uh, probably not. But I mean, that's the thing. We have to realize what is ideal versus what is real. What is the situation that we want to have? Do we want to create a solution that is, you know, equitable for all, or do we want one that tastes good for the rich? Because the idea of the bourgeoisie and the proletariat struggle is true, because while we are trying to make these problems and solve them, when we have people of a CEO level and extremely wealthy taking PJs everywhere, right, it's not going to be a situation where this solution is going to be utilized. We have to come together as a collective behavior and decide that we're going to make these changes or else just some people doing it is not going to be the solution. Sociologically, we can look at this, the idea of collective agency and behavior and understand that the group mentality requires us to be able to work as a unified group in order to find them, find them place in between where we can on all socioeconomic statuses find solutions to better the equity of our children's future right so it's a really big idea that we can't just think about now we have to think about the future you have to forecast because if you're not forecasting what you're doing is you're walking into uncertainty and if you're walking into uncertainty we don't know where that leads right so there's some positive but there's some neutrals there's some negatives there's some horrible things that can happen modernity basically doesn't always mean good all that glitter is not gold right dangers of innovation uh, ghost guns. If you are or are not familiar with ghost guns, uh, they are 3D printed, untrackable, untraceable. There was recently an assassination with a homemade gun in Sri Lanka, and that's a big thing. And ghost guns, you can download their prints off of the internet extremely easy, and it's absolutely terrifying because these have no trace and no ability to be able to track the shooter. And these are another example of the innovation not leading to a positive outcome. A lot of bans are going up on these. Prior to that, they were pretty accessible to people and some of the issues. The epidemic of school shootings and mass shootings in the United States, needless to say, is terrible. I'm from Illinois, so I actually grew up around Highland Park, so this recent shooting was quite impactful for me. 
but uh, all the glitter is not gold. So there's a lot of terrible things that can happen from it. Also, if it's not cheap, will society use it? This is just an example of resin, but the reality is, is that uh, how many of us really think about the cookies, right? The Emerson quote, we don't think about the blood in the cookies and we're eating them. We don't think about if it is, are they really a good company that we're buying from? Or are we cool with paying $2 instead of 20? Like, are you wanting to spend less to get more? Or are you wanting to spend more to be able to waste less, right? Um, if you are familiar with the brand Tom's, um, many of you might be wearing someone right now or in my classes, many people are. A uh, great idea. Originally, the idea of philanthropic engagement allowed a lot of people to want to buy it, buy a pair of overpriced shoes, and then some person in Africa gets a pair of shoes donated, right? But if you weren't aware, um, one of the major professions in Africa is cobblers. And if you want to aware of what cobblers are, those are shoemakers. So what you're looking at in that circumstance is that ideal versus real problematic, right? So if we are buying these brand shoes that we like to support a philanthropic cause, and then that cause is causing a massive labor shortage in an area where cobbling is a major impact. So they may not make the best shoes in that sense, or they may be too expensive in that sense, but to get a $2 pair of crap shoes is going to be free to the people. And that will then cause a lot of people to go out of work. So do we care about the blood and the cookies or the treats? A lot of times we don't. You know, a lot of people make fun of people if they want to know if the company has a green background or not. Some thoughts to think. I'd love to hear some thoughts on Yellow Dig about this. Uh, so in sociology, we do have a branch called environmental sociology. Environmental sociology is the study of the interactions between societies and their natural environments. Environmental sociology emerges as a subfield of sociology, so it's not a major field, in the 1970s in response to the emergence of the environmental movement in the 1960s. Essentially, environmental sociological imagination is needed, right? Ability to perceive the relationship of human action and their effects on Earth as a biosphere system. And, you know, sociological imagination in essence, right, is this idea that we can picture ourselves in the big picture and understand how our small impact impacts the large impact but how the reality is that the large impact is not always impact, is not always ground vastly impacted by us but it does impact our choices which then lead to us impacting the choices of the future generations so it's this long kind of paradigm but there are different types of understanding why we look at this in sociology. One is which is food deserts. Maybe you're not familiar with it. Areas that don't have ac equal access to food. Either you only have access to really crappy foods like McDonald's uh, or you don't have major grocery supply chains. And we've talked about this in the ideal versus the real. If we open up a Fry's, Basha's, Safeway, et cetera, we could then put the mom and pop stores out of business. But food deserts don't have access to really any resources and people have to, hard choices to get healthy food to take care of themselves. All they have is the major distributional chains such as McDonald's or even lack there of that. So low-income tra tracks in which substantial numbers of portions of the population have low access to supermarkets or resources. Population increases, human change, the environment, and the social stratification plays into these types of environments. The tragedy of the commons, right? Your book uses it with the idea of elephants and talking about this, but it's especially impactful towards the dynamicism of understanding that we take destroy the area, move on. But with humans, we leave people there who are low SES, who are now facing these food deserts, water deserts, and all these areas where we're seeing so many resources not applicable, technological deserts. It's a term we can keep using, but the sense is the lack of resources causes inequalities. And environmental racism is a huge factor, uh, whether you see it or not. Um, I always bring this up. I'm from Chicago. I worked in drive time, automotive auto group is one of my sales company and you see this. Where do you place all the subprime lending uh, vehicle dealerships, poor neighborhoods? Where do you see uh, all the industrial plants? Usually by every major college, there is some type of ghetto or bad neighborhood, right? And the reason for this is, is that a lot of the times they place the university there, build up walls, and then the impoverished are impacted. One of the worst places for people to live and be able to live a good life is actually in Orlando right outside of Disneyland. So happy place, negative area. So why do we see an APS plant in Tempe? Because it is right by an impoverished area next to university, but an impoverished area. So minority neighborhoods are burdened with a disproportionate number of hazardous and such as toxic waste facilities facilities, garbage dumps, and other environmental pollutions, thus lowering the long-term lifespan and health and happiness of life of areas of those who are socioeconomically on the other side. And many times it's race that plays into this, right? Because race is more important than socioeconomic status in predicting the locations of the nation's commercial hazardous waste facilities. You know, the rich go out and play in the Hamptons and the poor have to go swim in the lake that we don't know if it has radiation, but hey, I didn't get sick yet, right? It can be really bad. It really can. It's really terrible to think about this. But so Bulliard talks about this in 2007. If you're interested in that article, go look it up. It's fascinating. But social inequality, long-term life 
determining factors and so much more. Think of places like Flint, Michigan. I worked at realtor.com selling when that all happened. And wow, it was crazy to hear all the realtors realize they couldn't sell anything because of the water quality going on. South side of Chicago, you look at the Caprini Green, you look at all the amount of guns, liquor and lotto tickets being sold in an area and the amount of impact of like hazardous materials and people have been forced to be in situations where the city is dismantled, which creates a sense of cultural deviance, which leads to a lot of people having different aspects of looks and life socially. Detroit, Michigan, right, once was a booming city. Now you can see movies like Don't See. And the reality is you have these abandoned mansions in this non taken care of environment where people are forced to live there and make choices that are almost kind of like post-apocalyptic because it's not being taken care of because it's seen as a poor neighborhood and there's a certain race and group of people there, right? There is a liquor store in every corner and a factory in every town in the bad area. So come for the culture, leave with the cancer, unfortunately. Watch this video, please. And I'm not going to play it here. It's longer, but it's looking at Love Canal. It's a great example of the Super PAC Act. Also talking about what happened with Niagara Falls area where we undiscovered years and years and years of toxic, toxic, toxic waste being dumped into communities where there was mental health issues being done, cerebral palsy, cancer in young children, just because a company decided to dump waste into the ground and try to hide it and then move themselves so no one could know about it. And then you also see how funding stops. Funding stops for these organizations and then where they're left to figure out on their own. Uh, Lensky, I hope you remember him, right? I've mentioned a few times societies are based on their technological sophistication, smoke signals, carrier pigeons, landlines, cell phones, the internet to be determined. How do we get forward with our technological innovation? As we advance our technologies, govern, control, and impact our daily lives, routines, roles, and involvements in society, what happens when we have no longer need for the smaller world? What happens in those situations, right? So as we keep going and looking at this, how do we communicate smoke signals, then carrier pigeons, landlines, cell phones, the internet to be determined how further we go? What happens when transportation gets adjusted and augmented, such as self-driving cars through Uber and Waymo, right? What we're looking at is the people who are going to be displaced are going to be those who do the bus driving. The people who do the bus driving are in the lower socioeconomic statuses and many times fall into minority statuses. So they'll be fired, not the CEOs, just the drivers. And we'll have a whole amount of unemployment impact, the lower SES, which will be quietly ignored on the internet because, and on the news because it's not a pressing enough issue. So if we advance in technology, govern and controls our daily lives, then we see a lot of the impact this has on the socioeconomic stability and satisfaction of the people within the population. We also see this idea of technological innovation hindering mental health and also creating a lot more anxiety and problems in social reality, right? Disassociation, discombobulation, and all these different areas our people are facing because of the pandemic, but also because of the fact that we have this phone locked in our hands, right? Like how many of you walk around with your phone? How many of you face phantom vibrations? I'd love to hear if you guys still do feel, deal with that on Yellow Dig. I do or I'll feel like my phone vibrates, or if I see a notification, my wife has to check hers at all time. It becomes almost like habitualized that she has to check her notifications, not even if it matters, we're out on a date, right? And you have to check it because we've been so consumed by having a little bit of everything all of the time. As of recent news, only 40 something million people even watch the news because we're all so terrified of even turning it on because every day there's been something worse. And I know it's a lot. I know it's a lot, it's a lot, but realize that these technological innovations has also led to information overload. And that's scary. It's really scary because before we maybe only had certain sources, but who do we trust now? People don't trust the news. People don't trust what they're hearing. Everything seems to be getting worse. We need to find a way to kind of quell this and work as a society to not be in an anomically panic state in time because deaths of disparity are a really big thing going on right now. So, I mean, technology makes things easier, but I also appreciate the lower class jobs, how long until bus drivers, like I just said, this is a funny scene, Wally, -E, right? And then the new technology from Razor. I mean, the reality is happening. Who do you think is impacted by these choices? The lower SES or the higher SES? I kind of hinted that in the last part of this. And yeah, it's the lower, right? People who are getting displaced and fired and having to figure it out are not going to be the people who have the money, right? So technology and society and globalization, essentially technology is the driving force of change within society and it drives force behind globalization. Globalization happens in three different stages. First, drive by military expansion, horsepower and wind power, 15th century until the 1800s. Second, globalizing economy from the 1800s to the 2000s, right? Steam and rail power. Now we're in the post-millennial era driven by technology, certain software as a service and whatnot, particularly the internet. Friedman talks about this. So technology and sociology blend into globalization based upon how we are now communicating information and what is the most effective way to do so. And why are we going and conquering? Why are we colonizing? Why are we taking over land, resource production, wanting the things we want? And what's that gonna look like in the future? These are three great examples. They go deep more in detail in the book. If you wanna read Friedman's work on the post-millennial area, please do so. And always share on Yellow Dig your thoughts. 
but we can also tie to this idea of technologic, right? Technology can create positive links to social change, advancement, medicine, right? Population growth, uh, genetically alter and patent food production, environmental change, great. It can also do not so good things, right? Digital divide, we saw this in the pandemic when we had to switch to online learning, the access of resources of, of cable internet or stable internet is not in every household, quite the contrary. You know, there was that picture that got disputed, but it's still a great example of the person sitting in front of Taco Bell, I mean, these are things people don't all have working internet at home. And what about, you know, who doesn't? It's the people who can't afford it. The wealthy do, they have it. And if they don't have it, they'll get it in two seconds. So what you're looking at is new systems, new theft, new ways to be stolen from and taken advantage of. Thinking of all the fraud that happens to the elderly right now. Millions and millions upon millions of dollars are being stolen from the elderly on the basis and the sole basis that they don't understand the technological innovation and are being manipulated. Many, many children are facing anxiety, strength issues based upon how much reliance they have on this technology, right? It creates the problem. Hysteria, like the Y2K scare. You're all too young to probably understand this, but I remember that everyone I knew thought nukes were going to fire because the banking systems and the, and the bomb systems were uh, set to go zero, 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 zero when it hit year 2000, and we weren't worried. We were worried that that was going to fire off the trigger form. So everyone thought the world's kind of going to end. Uh, kind of crazy. But the CDC uses the term electronic aggression to describe any type of harassing and bullying through email. Uh, this is the crazy part for me, right? Um, <clears throat> I grew up in a time where shit hit the fan in school, of course, but when you went home, you were safe. Now the bullying really starts when you get home. I would love, I would love, 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 and I hope you do this. I would love for you all to share what is bullying in this modern era? How have you faced the cyber bullying that has happened to you when you came home from middle school, high school, et cetera, right? What is the new fear? Are you more scared about in-person? Is that less offensive in, in, in your face? Or are people more aggressive online and not offline? Uh, you know, this is something for me to learn. I would love to study this. I think it's fascinating because it's like, you know, there's a new shift, the same story, right? So 27.8% of students aged 12 to 18 have reported bullying and 9% of the same specific sample reported being victims of cyber bullying. Roberts in 2003, 2013, covered this. I imagine that there's been much data change on this. So let's look at some things here, right? Mental health, interest, interesting gender bias here, right? So we can look at the data here in the bottom, social media worries. We have the different things here. Please take a look at this when you have time. Go over the date details here. Essentially, U.S. teenagers who have experienced major depression in the past year, significant changes from 20, well, 2004 till 2018, with women having a much higher dip. Uh, we have millennials, Gen X, boomers, and, and uh, matures. We have different generations there with the amount of categories there, like we talked about, right? Uh, who was impacted? I think it'd be fascinating if this new study by the American Psychological Association looked at Gen Z, but even millennials are showing a tick way more so than the boomers and way more so than the silent generation of having worries about mental health. Uh, hours of a day or masses when people are scared you see this trend on TikTok and you will you tell me your watch time it's crazy it's really crazy watch the recent interview on TikTok of Chris Pine it's a good one if you're interested mental health we have the watch this if you haven't seen this it's on Netflix right it's called the social dilemma essentially this is tying to panopticism Foucault's theory to indicate the kind of internal servant surveillance if you aren't familiar Foucault broke down panopticism as such essentially it's the guard tower mentality and he built it off into the theory that if in prisons they would structure prisons around this circular tower in the middle and the circular tower essentially looked like it could look at everything right? You're looking at everything. But in theory, you don't even know if guards are in there. But because the prisoners on the side could see into the guard tower, but not see directly into the guard tower, they never knew if they were not being watched. And so they acted accordingly that they were being watched, which enforced behavioral patterns and people's response to circumstances. This has become the new norm. Many of us, if I sit on my phone and I say, I'm sorry, I'm going to do this to myself, but I'm going to hate myself for it. Frank's Buffalo Sauce, Frank's Buffalo Sauce, Jersey Mike's, I'm probably going to get an ad in 20 minutes about Buffalo sauce and Frank's probably connected about the Buffalo sandwich at Jersey Mike's, but it's become normal and in interviewed a lot of Gen Z says, whatever, this is part of life. It's been socialized, but really how far is this going to go with the panopticon? How far are we going to be observed in everything we do? I don't even, in one of my older cars that isn't even technologically advanced, my phone can tell me and tracks it with little geotags to let me know where my car is. Now, when I get lost, that's fantastic. And I can find my car. However, how weird is it that I've never set that up? But my phone is already telling me where my car is. How far are we going to allow this type of situation to persist? The watcher ceases to be the external, external to the watched. We no longer are know we're being watched and we're being watched and we just accept that we're being watched. If you're a fan of Futurama, they have a great thing with having ads in your dreams. I don't know how far we go away from that. But uh, social media, same place, different time. Uh, please watch this video. It's really cool. We're talking about the micro macro selfie. Pretty cool. Society is a social construct. However, it's subjective and modern objective view. We, we realize that 
everything is kind of just repeating itself. History does tend to repeat itself. So make sure that you're paying attention to trends, oscillations, and learn your history because it will help you. Diversity, one cool thing here is what we're looking at is there's been a significant change in people's perspective on it. US population becomes more diverse all the time. Younger generations are more diverse and more accepting than ever before, according to Pew Research, which is the golden standard research. We're looking at a lot of people dating interracially, which is fantastic. So we're seeing a lot of people being able to create new cultural dy dynamics. You know, we have a lot of work to do, but we're headed in the right direction. And let's keep scouts from taking away uh, Loving V, Virginia. Keep your eyes on that, please. Uh, race, ethnic profile for the total U.S. and under 16 populations. Look at this. Crazy. We're seeing change. Love it. And sociological imagination. This is kind of where we're going to start ending this class on this slide. So the sociological imagination as proposed by C. Wright Mills essentially is seeing how our individual lives are connected to the larger social structure, the way society looks, operates, and functions, and how that impacts us. We may be small, but the world impacts us and we impact the world. We, go, we, we look for the strange in the particular and the uncommon in the common. We go through our personal and social changes during our lifetimes and that impacts our socialization. And we always need to make sure that we're not having cultural lag. Seeing the bigger picture of society and the way that we link it in each other and perspective taking and empathy skills. These are skills that can have benefit for you in every single job field you'll ever go into. One of the things that I really want to talk to you about as your professor is that I don't have a traditional academic background. I'm not somebody who has always been in academia. I didn't spend all my time in the ivory walls. I went into the world and I worked hard and I was very successful, but I learned that my sociological imagination and my training was able to benefit me. I hope you can take things from this class and realize that you can become a director of research and business development. You become a sales manager, you can become a CEO, you can become a boss, whatever you wanna be. Sociology, if you decide to use it, is teaching you how to analyze social behaviors and understand what the world needs and how people interact. You can take this information I'm teaching you if you choose to and become hyper successful from it. And I hope you do reach out to me. I can give you resources if you need them. But essentially, the material that you're learning here is everyday interactions. Understanding why we do what we do and how we do what we do is what marketing companies pay hand over fist for. You have to understand the population. And if you understand the population, then you can understand how things work. Being social smart or book smart, street smart, having both is seen as the goal. But street smarts is just knowing how and why people interact. My father would go overseas and his ability to just understand cultures allowed him to be able to have an ace up his sleeve, I'm essentially be in the room where it happens. And my ability to do so has been the same. I hope that you take this class seriously. I don't know what it means to be an online class at this one. I've taken online classes and I love them, but everyone's experience is different. Please reach out to me throughout the course. And if you need any questions, please email me. I would love to hear your feedback. If you want to personally email me, positive or negative, because I'm a growth mindset. I want to learn. And I hope that you enjoy it. Good luck on your final exam. It is cumulative, but that also can be to your benefit because you may get tons of questions, you know. Please study hard, do your work, and you'll do great. And I, would, I teach a social deviance class. If you're interested in learning more about deviance, I'd love to take the, teach that to you. Um, just I hope you have a wonderful rest of your time here at ASU. And I hope this has been a helpful and useful course material. So from myself, from my, my TAs, and all the people who are part of this organization, as well as ASU, thank you for taking Social 101. I hope you've learned some information. And please reach out if you need anything. I am a resource, both in this class and in the future. I really mean that. I have had an interesting journey to where I am here, and anything that I've learned that could help you, I'd love to share. This is Professor McQueen, and thank you so much for taking this social introductory course. I know some of these videos have been long. I'm sure this one's long because I'm doing this, but I want to teach. I want to be here. I chose to be here. I have had an interesting journey. It would have made more sense for me to stay in the marketing world because I was doing well, but I wanted to be a part of something different. And I really love this. And thank you for taking this course. And I hope that you have a wonderful time at ASU. And I hope you take sociology and use it. Use it. Even if you're never going to study again, use what you've learned in this class. Behavioral analysis is quintessential in all fields. There's not one field it doesn't help for. Thank you again. And I will hopefully hear from you in the future. And have a great luck on your final exam or your cumulative final exam. Take care.